right, Douglas Murray, thanks for being with us today. Uh, you talk about Europe being engaged in some kind of suicidal act where there are declining birth rates, there's mass immigration, there's this self-hatred, self-guilt, and there's multiculturalism that is destroying Europe. Why is this relevant to Americans? Well, my feeling is that absolutely everything I describe in this book uh, is a result of traveling all across Europe and meeting the people who've just arrived and meeting the leaders of Europe. My feeling is that all of the things we've gone through are just examples of things that America is starting to go through as well. It's just that we in Europe are further down the road. So to my mind, this is a warning siren to you in America, really, of what not to do. And what is that? Is it the, the mass immigration? Is it what, what should it be? What should we not it's, do? It's a whole set of things. The first thing is the, the mass immigration. Europe has been taking people in in recent years far too fast, far too fast, particularly to be able to integrate them into European society. We don't have a chance at this pace. Second thing is to try to integrate people who are here. We've been terrible at that for all sorts of reasons I lay out in the book. And another thing is just the thing of not, not having this self-distrust and self-hatred, which is what we in Europe have cultivated for more than a generation, and which I'm afraid I see not only on American campuses, but in parts of American thought as a whole. One of the things that I was reading in your book is the fact that uh, Angela Merkel was engaged in conversations with uh, Zuckerberg on Facebook, yes. trying to figure out how she could curtail or they could curtail the free speech rights of, of, of individuals who criticize her. So while you cut down the free speech of people who live in a particular country, you just open the borders to the world. I mean, and, yes. It's extraordinary. Uh, yes, uh, you know, the peoples of Europe are very unhappy about this. And the idea that you would at this stage stop them from expressing that unhappiness is absolutely crazy. But yes, I think we need to be able to criticize her. I think we need to be able to criticize these crazy immigration policies. And I, at any rate, don't want to have to claim political asylum here in the U.S. anytime soon, much as I love your country. Well, you know, one of the things that, that you talk about in the book is you say that you don't have a problem with change. But when change comes as quickly uh, and, uh, you know, as, as it's done in Europe, uh, it, it will change the character of Europe. Is that a bad thing? Well, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, uh, countries and cultures change slowly all the time. But when they change at this swiftness, I think there is a very, very significant problem coming. You know, because I've traveled for this, like I say, across the entire continent, and there are places in Europe now that would be utterly unrecognizable. This isn't about race either. This is about ideas. It's about the ideas people bring with them. And some of those ideas, as we have seen in the rise of things like Sharia courts in the UK, in the rise of extremism and intolerance, including intolerance towards women and ethnic and religious and right, sexual so minorities, how, how is have, really worrying. Douglas, how do you have these Sharia courts in the UK? You know, there is a movement in this country and laws in about 17 or 18 states, American laws for American courts to prevent the effort to have Sharia courts. How did it happen so easily in the UK? It, it came in through the back door really in something called the Arbitration Act where you can volunteer for arbitration as long, you know, pretty much in any system you like and uh, the Sharia courts offered to do it that way. They're still not meant to supersede British law, but I've spoken to people who've been judged in Sharia courts, right. and it's clear they do supersede British law on occasion. And why wouldn't they? They get away with it and nobody pays much attention. What are your hopes for the United States? My hope is that you can do uh, rather better what we've done so badly. And I think, by the way, you have. I mention this in the book, that although you've got in America, they say, lots of the thought problems that we have in Europe, albeit in a less developed form, nevertheless, you also have an identity thing in America that remains enormously powerful mm -hmm. to people who arrive here. Too many people, obviously, that we read about all the time, spit on the freedoms you have. But actually, the ideas and the ideal of America is something which people can really integrate into. And I'm afraid in Europe, we're stuck in a thing of not just being hard, finding it hard to integrate these people, but often people not wanting to integrate anyway. So I think you are starting off at a better place, but we certainly wouldn't be starting off from here. All right. Douglas Murray, thanks so much for being with us today, and good luck with your book. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Concern. I have two primary concerns when it comes to the Syrian refugees. One is obviously the fact that we can't screen them. And despite the Obama administration's protestations, that yes, we have beautiful vetting procedures. 
right? The same vetting procedures that got you Major Nidal Hassan, the same vetting procedures that got you the Chattanooga Tennessee shooter, the same vetting procedures that got you the Sarnia brothers, right? All of these vetting procedures, they say that they're going to do biometric scans, which are completely useless unless you actually have physical evidence of these people committing criminal acts elsewhere, right? You have nothing to scan them against. It's like saying they're going to fingerprint these folks. Well, unless you have fingerprints at a crime scene somewhere else, that doesn't make any difference. They say that they're going to interview them. What does that interview look like? I mean, really, what is that? They say apparently the, person, the people doing the interviews have eight days of training on Syria, and then they're thrown right in. Uh, they say that they're going to do background checks. By calling whom? Who do you actually call? You call Bashar Assad and ask him for, for, his, for his information. <laughs> right? There's, they, it's, so it's nonsensical. People on Homeland Security Committee know this is nonsensical. The, the, today, the House passed a bill curbing Syrian immigration after Homeland Security came and made a presentation. They actually lost votes after the for Homeland Security. So that's one issue. The other issue is, what is the nature of the immigrants that you're bringing in, period? And this is not a religious issue, it's a values issue. Are the people who you're bringing in going to make the country a better place, or are they going to make the country a more polarized place? Do they have any experience with Western-style democracy? Do they believe in any of the same American rights that we believe in, or not? And that's a very relevant question to ask about any immigrants and any class of immigrants. Now, do I think it's stupid to say you're not going to bring in five-year-old orphans? Yes, I think that's dumb. But do I think that it's, that it's not stupid to say you ought to look at the values of the people that you're bringing in? I would say that about people of any religion. And the fact is that when you're talking about people who are coming from a place like Syria, which has no history of democracy, no history of human rights, no history of basic American rights, like freedom of speech, no idea of what equality of sexes looks like, there's going to be a culture clash. Look at Europe. Europe is full of culture clash because of the vast wave of Muslim immigration. So on those two, le on those two levels, I'm extremely worried about the Syrian refugee wave. And by the way, question for the Ummah, right, the, the Muslim nation that is supposed to take everybody in. There are a billion Muslims on planet Earth, and there are 52 Islamic majority countries on planet Earth. None of you have room for these folks? None of you? Right, Turkey is taking in about 2 million of them. 15% are still in refugee camps. The truth is that the Ummah has a pretty poor record of taking in refugees. Right, for, all, for all the talk about how it's the Israelis who are victimizing the Palestinians, for example, there are still 70 years later 10 refugee camps in Jordan. There are 13 refugee camps full of Palestinians in Syria. There are refugee camps in the south of Lebanon for Palestinians two generations after the creation of Israel. By contrast, Israel has taken in every wave of Jewish refugees that has ever existed. So, the, so you know, I, I'm, I, I'm getting tired of hearing the, the sort of unearned moral superiority of the Muslim world when it comes to, oh, you Westerners, you have to take our refugees. Could you please explain the unholy alliance between the left and the forces and the, uh, the Muslim supremacists, considering that the, pr the premises and the, s the principles of both of them are mutually incompatible? Okay, so they're not mutually incompatible to point A, they are to point B. What I mean is that it's a timeline. The left wants to tear down Western civilization because it thinks it's unequal. The radical Muslims want to tear down Western civilization because they think it's evil. So to the point of tearing down Western civilization, they're pretty much on the same page. It's where they go from there that's a problem. Right? One side wants to build a caliphate and the other side wants to build a communist utopia. The, the, the reason that the left is routinely, and it, it's almost invariable, that the left ends up siding with the world's worst human beings in every situation is because, again, if you just go back to that fundamental leftist principle that equality of outcome is all that matters in life, that equality of outcome means that something just is happening, think about it. The real world is a place where God designed it this way. I believe this. God designed it not for every individual, but certainly for the vast bulk of humanity. If you do responsible good things with your life, you will be more successful than if you do irresponsible bad things with your life. Well, if the left believes that people who are unsuccessful are more virtuous, then what that means is that the non-virtuous are more virtuous, right? Because the people who are unsuccessful are generally not doing good, responsible things. And the left says, well, those people are victims. Let's help them. Right? So the Muslims in the Middle East are victims of Israel. They must be victims of Israel because Israel's rich and its neighbors are not, so they must be victims. Well, the real reason the Muslims, the Palestinian Muslims, for example, are poor is because they've spent all the money that has been given to them, hundreds of billions of dollars, all the money that's been given to them over the course of decades, and they've spent it on terrorism, and they've spent it on stocking it away in their bank accounts of Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas, and they've spent it on garbage, and they've spent it on anti-Israel propaganda. That's the real reason they're poor, but the left looks at it and they say, they're poor, that means they're virtuous. This is why I hate it, really despise it. When Republicans do the whole, I'm a better person because I have a rags to riches story, you weren't a better person when you're poor. Okay? No one is a better person just because they're poor. By the way, no one's a better person because they're rich. 
All that wealth is is a measure of how many voluntary exchanges you engaged in in a free market. That's all that, that's all that, that wealth is. But the, the idea for the left is that all inequality is evil. Therefore, the people who are unequal at the top are evil and the people at the bottom are virtuous. Which is why you'll hear people on the left say things like they like small business but they hate people who are big business, like the Walmart family, right? the Walton family. They're terrible. Well, were they terrible when they were just a family living in the middle of nowhere? When, when exactly did they transition over into evil? Right? When they became successful enough because their success meant by necessity, according to the leftist worldview, they were depriving others of, of their fair share. And Bernie Sanders said this right after winning New Hampshire the other night. And this is Bernie Sanders' entire thing. He says, the principle of America is the principle of fairness, which makes me want to vomit and never stop vomiting. <laughs> the principle of America is not fairness of outcome. And he was talking about fairness of outcome. He said, oh, how, it's unfair that 1% of the population lives with more wealth than 90% of the rest of the population. <laughs> and Well, Maybe, or maybe it's not unfair, because it turns out that 1% of the population is hiring the other 90% of the population to actually provide their services and labor. So my, my feeling about the, my feeling about illegal immigration, the idea that illegal immigration... So you support his immigration policies to just worry he's not deeply convicted, not too much. At least in part. I, I disagree with him on H-1B visas, because high-tech visas bring in people who actually are capable of doing work and not taking taxpayer dollars, but people who are coming in who are lower income and living up in tax credit. California economics proves this, okay? If you bring in millions and millions of people who, and not because they're bad people, it's not nothing to the bad. The people who are coming in are looking for... Well, they're not bad, they're just stealing our jobs. No, no, I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I this is, where I, this is where I think that Trump is an idiot. I'm not saying that they're rapists. They don't mischaracterize what I'm saying because you, you're talking about what Trump is saying. Okay, my view is that in a perfectly, in a perfectly welfare state-free society, open borders and free movement of labor is totally fine. It's the Milton Friedman position. The problem is when you give out welfare, when you give out free education, when you give out Obamacare, when you give out food stamps, and then you say to people, my front door is wide open, a lot of people are going to come in and they're going to take advantage of the system, which is what's happening in the state of okay. <laughs> I'm not accusing you, like, I'm not like saying, oh, and you did, right? But I am You're talking so about, the argument well, I'm talking about a policy and a practice in our country. Look, we happen to have this anti-immigrant surge at this moment in our country. It, you know, every, and I, I, I don't know if you've been to other panels, but if you've been watching the conversation, this isn't about, it's like, oh, well, we had the Irish and Italian immigrants, those were good immigrants, right? They came and they didn't, right? And they worked hard and they were good immigrants, but now they're bad immigrants, right? And people are talking about they don't like immigrants who are moving into their community, changing the culture of their community. This is very much connected to Donald Trump. Look, this, this, this is the point of the whole freaking debate. Right? But I you don't have you can rationalize it. it. You can rationalize it in policy. You can say, yes, this is about not giving away government benefits to immigrants. But guess what? Your party also is the party that wants to cut those benefits. So it becomes an illogical argument to say, well, hey, we want to cut the benefits. Wait. But the fact that we have the benefits is our argument for not letting people in this country. No, it's not it's, illogical it's, at all. I want to cut the benefits. Thing. And they won't cut the benefits, then people can't come in and take them for free. It it's is not illogical at all. In 2008. <laughs>